So, yeah, I assembled this talk thinking, what better opportunity than this to sort of indulge myself in telling you all about my life, because you're kind of stuck here with me for the next 30 to 45 minutes, and I can say whatever I want. Um, so hopefully it's not too boring. Uh, I think some of the stories are amusing. I uh, think some of them maybe have, have things that will resonate for folks, and so hopefully it's fun for everybody and not just for me. Uh, while I was putting it together, I was uh, browsing the Wayback Machine looking for some images Jay had made for me back in the day, and I came across my original homepage from the 90s. Um, if you can imagine an internet where you can put a link that embeds your email address on your homepage and actively ask everybody to send you email if they ever see that link, it's a very different internet than the internet we have today, where you would uh, minimally obfuscate your email address so you didn't get too much spam. Uh, but uh, I haven't changed all that much since this time. I have often said uh, that to my wife that I don't think I've changed since I was 13. She asserts that I have, but uh, she never says whether it's for the better or worse. <laughs> so um, this was originally going to be an about me slide, but it grew into the entire talk. Um, so uh, like I said, um, it's going to be more or less pure indulgence. Uh, I just wanted to say for, for some of the stories, especially the first few here where I try to explain why I'm still alive, um, please don't try these things at home. Uh, so they're risky. Um, and uh, obviously, it's a great honor to be selected for the, for the award. And so thank you for, to the Selection Committee of the University for recognizing me. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know what to say. There's a lot of thanking to do. So I'm going to just skip all that and be a bad person. Uh, so without further ado, I think I'll dive right in, kind of mindful of the time. So. Uh, the slides are background noise to the talk, so I'm actually going to say something that is related to, but not what's on the slide. So if I'm getting boring, you can read the slide and see if it's more interesting. Uh, I had this awesome uncle growing up in Greece uh, who worked for the Greek electrical utility, and he loved to do experimentation, and that was amazing, because he was an adult, and so I could do things with him that were clearly adult supervised, um, that were possibly not as supervised as one might imagine. And the best thing we did was we took these pipes that had bolts that fit tightly in them, and we fitted fins on the back to make bombs, and we spent a whole evening scraping the match heads off of self-striking matches to accumulate a big pile of match powder. And you mix that with gunpowder, and you put it in the pipe, and you have a thing that's ready to explode. This is, I mean, I was 12 or something. This is awesome. Um, and this is in Greece. Uh, I was living there for a year at the time because my dad was on sabbatical from University of Manitoba. And uh, my uncle had to go to a shift at the electrical utility. And he left us with a very clear admonition. Under no circumstances are you going to try these bombs before I'm back in the morning. <laughs> and he left. What could go wrong? <laughs> so in Greece, the roofs are flat because there's no such thing as snow. And so you just walk up the staircase to the roof, and you walk across the roof, and you walk to the edge, and it's nice and dark, and you hold the bomb like this, and you drop it, and it falls. Boom! This enormous flash. I mean, it was so bright. It was so loud. It was so awesome. Let's do that again! And we run back downstairs to grab the bomb and reload it, and all we find is the bolt. The pipe part of the bomb is mysteriously gone. And we're 12, and we're not putting two and two together, so we think, you know, now how do we avoid getting caught? We better stop here and not do another one. We did have another one ready to go, but in our wisdom, we decided to save it for morning. It really doesn't come to my recollection how it is that we avoided getting in trouble for that, because uh, the next morning, we went to do it again with my uncle in attendance. It was awesome. He thought it was awesome we were going to do it again. It was going to be awesome. And so I'm standing there holding this thing by my head, looking down. And there's these nice bright white fins on the back of this black pipe and the, and the bolt in it. And I drop it, and bang, and flash, this white thing goes right by my head. <laughs> and that's when I realized, hey, we've invented a new kind of gun. It's shooting the back half of the bomb right past my head on the roof of the house, so fast that I could barely see it fly by me out of the corner of my eye. And if I had just dropped it like this, I wouldn't be here. That's the difference. This versus this. Life-saving fact. Don't drop a bomb in front of your head. Um, so uh, this, of course, didn't dissuade us from building bombs, but we realized we needed an automated release mechanism. Because <laughs> obviously it was too dangerous to have a person up there. It didn't occur to us to stop doing it, you see, because that obviously would be the wrong path. We had to perfect this awesome thing we had made. And so we just uh, jury-rigged a piece of wood off the edge of the roof and nailed two nails into it and took a thin strip of wire across it. And just like a light bulb, if you run electricity through a thin strip of wire, it glows. But unlike a light bulb, when it's not enclosed in a vacuum, it disintegrates and then that lets the bomb fall. And now you can stand on the 
the ground, hook it up to a 12 volt battery and drop the bomb. And so we did that a bunch um, until we had perfected it. And we made these great bombs that were super big and heavy and had less gunpowder in them and didn't actually backfire very often. And we thought we have victory. And so I dropped one of these off the porch like this. And that one wasn't quite right. And it did come back and hit my forehead. And there's a scar there to remind me that you have to drop the bombs on the side. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so in an effort to make this somewhat relevant to computer science, I'll just say uh, a proper test harness is useful. <laughs> <laughs> Build it and deploy it before you really wish you had. Um, so the second uh, way I almost killed myself was uh, when I was working for Pulse Microsystems for TAS here. And uh, we sent me to Japan. This was a great honor for me at the time. It was like a big business trip. I was young, fresh out of school, working this awesome job. And I was going to go and deal with the Japanese, which was going to be some kind of cultural challenge. People who know me would appreciate that really well. Um, and so I had taken alcohol with me to give as gifts. And I had been learning the cultures and how to hand a business card with two hands and how to do all the right things to interact with these Japanese business people in the early 90s. And so of course, they took me out for a meal. Um, and the meal was awesome traditional Japanese food with all kinds of seafood and some kind of octopus type thing that happened to be the perfect match for the size of my throat. And I had picked it up with my chopsticks, and I didn't really know how to cut it with my chopsticks, so I just put it in my mouth, and it lodged itself in my throat, and I could not breathe at all. I've never experienced something like this, and I hope you never do either, but it's actually quite panic-inducing to realize that you can get no air, and you can make no sound, and you can do nothing, and that probably you have about 30 to 90 seconds. Um, I was really good at holding my breath as a teenager, so I knew I had about 60 seconds. I had timed that many times. Uh, and I thought, no problem. I know the universal symbol for choking. And so I did this, and my host looked away. I thought, okay, that's not working. So I stood up, and I'm in a restaurant, and I turned around like this. And everybody looked away. <laughs> and it was like, this is not going to work in this culture. I'm going to pass out right here now. I'm going to die right here now in this Japanese restaurant halfway across the world from my family because nobody knows what I'm doing. And they think it's very embarrassing. <laughs> very, very embarrassing. Uh, so it turns out that if you stand behind your chair and you put one fist here and one fist here and you throw yourself down, boing, the uh, squid or octopus or whatever it was will come out of your mouth at high velocity, smash your plate and scatter the food everywhere and make you feel very happy that you're still breathing and cannot talk. And uh, it turns out even in a traditional Japanese restaurant, a burger and fries can be produced in about 45 seconds. <laughs> I could not get my host to understand that there was no problem, that I liked the food, that I was fine. He, d he wanted the situation over as fast as possible, and me eating something I knew how to eat as fast as possible, and wanted no further discussion. So. Um, I think it's important to understand who you're communicating with to choose effective forms of communication. And uh, failing that, uh, to know some first aid. Uh, so I've already mentioned the company I was working for at the time. Uh, it was a CAD CAM company. And this is the kind of machine we had. It's a brother machine with tw 12 needles. So it can sew in 12 colors. And you stretch a piece of fabric into a hoop. And you attach it on. And it moves the XY axis with stepper motors. And you can draw out any design you want. And I had graduated from the CGL here, um, and I was really into graphics. And this was like a whole new way of doing graphics, where you could like stitch it out with thread on a piece of fabric. It was super awesome. And I was writing these computational geometry algorithms to control this machine. And it turns out I still hadn't learned my lesson about test harnesses, because uh, you know you just change the code and run it on the machine, see how it did, right? That's what you did. And uh, these machines don't have end stops. So on modern CNC or 3D printer machines, there are end stops that tell the machine it's gone too far and it disables the stepper from going. On these machines, they just keep going um, because you don't actually know how big the hoop is. You could have a small hoop or a big hoop, so there's no real logical way to reset the end stops every time. It would take too much time. Um, it would just slow down your production. Why would you have that? It turns out you'd have that if you have a young programmer who doesn't know that his thing can destroy the machine by driving it off the edge. Uh, and I'm sorry, Tasks. I'm sure that repairing it was not the cheapest thing on the planet, and I don't remember ever paying for it. Um, uh, so what I learned from this was that it's really handy to visualize your software. And so from then on, from then forwards, all the algorithms we built at that company, we'd have an elaborate visualizing tool that would show you the motions that the machine was going to make before it made them. And this turned out to save you a lot of trouble. Um, and it was really great when we were doing chenille embroidery and debugging 
the algorithm for that, for which we had a PhD student from some American university, I can't remember where because they're all the same, um, come and join us <laughs> for a few weeks uh, to, to, to debug his algorithm. And so we're debugging his algorithm using our visual debugger, and he's like, wow, I wish I had this when I was writing my thesis. It's like, yeah, you invented the algorithm. I think you needed this. Uh, and we got it working. So visualizing is, is pretty, pretty great, pretty good tool. Um, and around that time also, uh, the Java language was coming out. So the way I got into Java was I was really frustrated with the Whatcom linker. Apologies to people who work at Whatcom, and especially my friend Jim Randall, who was specifically responsible for the linker and got a lot of grief from me in the mid-90s. Because linking our application took about nine and a half to 12 minutes, because um, there were too many symbols. But anyway, the, the excuses aside. Um, and so nine and a half to 12 minutes was a long time. Uh, we even came up with this idea that wouldn't it be great if you could have a device that would make your CPU go faster? Let's say every time you put a, corner, a quarter in the front of the device. And no sooner had we come up with that idea than we were coming up with a system that would feed the quarters in as fast as possible. <laughs> um, and so we were out for dinner, uh, which was kind of a common thing for us then. I was out with Jay and, and others from the company. And I said, okay, we're, we're done with this. We're going to write a new language. We're going to rewrite everything in a new language. We're going to write a new linker. And then we're going to go back to writing embroidery software. And Jay, who was probably more interested in beer than writing a new compiler, uh, had a brilliant idea. He said, well, have you heard of Java? Which I hadn't. Jay was into all kinds of languages at the time, and so we'd both programmed a lot of different stuff, but I hadn't heard of this one because it was still in Alpha 3. And he introduced me to Java, and uh, that got me sufficiently distracted that um, we never did get around to writing our language. I still have ideas for it if you want to do your next startup. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to win the Java Cup competition, and I knew that to win the competition, we would actually have to have an entry for the competition. Oh. And, I, <laughs> and I knew that to have an entry for the competition, I had to start more than one team. Because if I started only one team, they wouldn't finish. So I started four teams to enter the Java Cup competition, and I did an entry by myself. And the only team that finished was Jay and I. Thank you for finishing. Everybody else bailed out over the course of the competition. So redundancy is good for you uh, if you want things to work. And redundancy worked out in this case, and we submitted this game, um, and it did eventually win. A really interesting story is, uh, I guess no one but us will remember, that this was originally orange um, until we started looking at it on the displays of the day and realized that we had better graphics cards than most people, and the orange wasn't going to work. So Jay desaturated all the imagery and went from this nice orange earthy palette to this very black and white palette just to make sure that it would work well on all the machines. And we had optimized it, just to remind you what the internet was like at this time, to work well on 9600 baud modems and be able to deliver game updates every half second at that speed. And that was pretty, uh, pretty good for the time. And the login and play button, which would download the Java applet to let you play, would warn you that you were in for a three minute wait on an average internet connection to download something that today I can download in a fraction of a second. Um, so aside from desaturating it, so it actually worked better for the users, we also had the mindfulness to say a few days before the deadline, hey, we should look at the judging criteria and make sure that we've hit them all. And it turned out the judging criteria wanted crazy things like sound and you know, other stuff. And so we added all those things at the last minute and, and ticked all the boxes. And I think that's also important if you're trying to get a good grade in anything to look at the marking schema because I've lost a lot of marks by not reading what the marker thinks it's about. And even if they're wrong, they still get to mark you. So it's important to know how they're going to do it and tick their boxes. Um, also around the same time, uh, I was pushing for asserts in the code base at Pulse. The asserts were kind of a new thing. I wanted the asserts to crash the program every time. And that wasn't really deemed acceptable because that was going to be too disruptive if the program crashed every few seconds. Uh, so instead, we settled on this compromise called the asserts log file. And I was explaining it to our QA person. I said, yeah, this log file it has a line in it. Every time there's a critical bug in the software, that means that somebody made a mistake. And this QA person, who really took pride in their job and felt that they were effective at finding all the bugs, opened up the log file and looked at the thousands of lines of logs from his work that morning, and his face just went pale. <laughs> he was like, what do you mean? Like, every line is a bug? It's like, yes, every line is a bug. Lines that are the same are the same bug happening again, but lines that are different are different bugs, and they mostly look different. And so he was not super thrilled about this, uh, and so he went off and did some analysis, and he came back, he says, did you realize that you are personally responsible for more than 60% of all the assertion failures? And I said, did you realize that I have written over 90% of all the assertions? <laughs> anyway, so that was fun. 
And, and my, my message here, which I think has worked for different teams of mine over the years, is when you're writing a piece of code and you're thinking, I know that blank, your fingers are typing assert blank. This habit has served me super well over the years, and uh, maybe it's just basics these days. I don't know. The state of the art might have advanced. Uh, I'm still debugging with printf, so I don't know about you. Um, but uh, this is a great thing to do. Um, then uh, from there, I moved on to Waterloo Maple, and at that time, I was doing my degree here part-time, uh, my master's degree, and working in symbolic math. Um, and I was really excited to be working at Maple because I had this notion that symbolic algebra systems were going to enable us to do work that you couldn't possibly do by hand. And so what I was doing from a master's degree was uh, writing a thing, uh, a new technique for deriving wavelet bases. So I wanted to come up with wavelet bases where the coefficients didn't look like god-awful things. I wanted wavelet bases where the coefficients looked pretty. Now, um, Richard Bartels, my, my awesome supervisor, who was one of the most influential people on me while I was here at the school, uh, didn't really understand my notion of pretty. He wanted me to formalize that in some way, which I'm not sure I ever did to his satisfaction. Nonetheless, I did get pretty wavelet bases out, and I did that mainly using Maple. And while I was working at Maple, uh, I was working with a bigger team than ever before because I had always optimized for working at small companies, companies with like less than 30 people. And Maple had like 120. That was a big company, 120 people, lots of people. <coughs> Google. Um, anyway, uh, so... Uh, the interesting thing was, even in a company of like 120 people, we had this great bug where you would insert a formula into a spreadsheet, you'd do a few other steps, you'd insert a spreadsheet, uh, sorry, you'd insert a formula into the document. The Maple GUI would let you edit a document, which amongst other things could contain sub-spreadsheets. You'd insert a spreadsheet, you'd save it, and the system would crash. And so somebody fixed it. Um, and the way they fixed it was they opened up the spreadsheet save method and they added a call to undo at the top of save. <laughs> QA did their work and verified it, bug fixed, ready to ship. And they filed a new bug that said, every time we save a worksheet, the last thing we did is gone. <laughs> so, yes, that is actually what happens when you call undo at the top of save, the last thing you did is gone. And so I was tasked with fixing that one and found this fix. And uh, uh, this really sold me on the value of code review. Um, so I don't know how well indoctrinated code review is everywhere, but at Google we use an internal system for it. That's, it's just the way you get things submitted all the time. Um, and I highly recommend code reviews where you don't do it by looking over each other's shoulder. It's really hard to tell somebody that they're wrong, like to their face, depending on the relationship. It's much easier to be mean over email. Um, <laughs> now, maybe your goal isn't really to be mean, but still, you're going to find more bugs if you do it over email. So that's my recommendation for, for code review. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And then back to the thesis thing for a minute, um, my whole worksheet, my whole thesis was a worksheet that generated all of the formulas and matrices and everything. And I could just sit there and hit enter in Maple and crank out each successive step so that there were no errors. And so I was very pleased when uh, Stephen Mann, who I believe is still teaching here uh, in the graphics department, uh, who was a reader for my thesis, handed me the thesis back and said, um, I circled places where I thought there might be errors in your math. Now that I've seen your talk, you can ignore those comments. That's how we should all do math, I think. Computer algebra for the win. I know Maple's a little obscure, but it's good. Um, the other interesting thing I learned at Maple was I was working for this manager who I think everybody but me hated. Um, uh, he was actually uh, good in some ways. Uh, all managers are good in some ways. Let me, another piece of wisdom I'll pass on to people. As a manager myself, I will say, if you hate your manager, remember that they are also a human and probably have good motives for what they're doing, even if they seem stupid and pointy-haired to you. Um, anyway, so everybody thought Paul uh, Hamilton was stupid and pointy-haired, uh, but he had one very brilliant uh, observation, and that was that if you build a schedule like this in your Gantt chart, and you're 85% accurate at estimating all of your tasks, then your odds of completing this tiny four-week schedule are 52%. Um, and 85% accuracy, I would suggest to you, is really good accuracy for estimating a coding task, so you're probably not that accurate in the first place. And so if you build schedules like this, you're for sure going to fail. And I think everybody figured that out somewhere along the line and decided, well, therefore, we can't do schedules. We should do something else called Scrum or something um, and not know at all when we're going to finish. But let's say you actually have a project that you wish to know when it will actually finish. And you want to finish actually at that time. Let's pretend that there was a reason you had to hit a date other than your pointy-haired boss. 
Um, there is a way to do this, a way that has worked for me before with teams up to about size 30. Um, and so I thought I'd take a minute and explain it. Uh, so this is less of a story and more of a lecture segment, but it, you will wake up at the end. Um, basically, it's like this. You can't estimate any task that will take less than two days. The error bar on a task that will take you an afternoon is super high. A task that will take you an afternoon will either actually take you the afternoon or it will take you two days. And that's just too big an error bar. You cannot deal with that. You can also not estimate a task that will take longer than about two weeks. We'll call that eight days of actual working time. Um, because when you're estimating a task that's going to take longer than that, you just run into some kind of human foible of innumeracy where it's like three weeks, that's so much time. <laughs> I can drive a whole new doctoral thesis in three weeks, right? No problem. I'm sure everybody who's completed their PhD is aware that you all finish on time. Um, so things that are too big are impossible to estimate, and things that are too small are impossible to estimate. So the trick is to take all the small stuff and aggregate it together into an agglomeration of stuff that should take about two or three days, and say, I'll get this basket of tasks done in two or three days. And the error bars and the things you get wrong will get cancelled out by the successes on the things you get right, and you can come out pretty close to two or three days on the small tasks. And on the big tasks, you have to subdivide them into tasks that you feel confident will take you less than eight days. And if you can't subdivide into tasks that will take you confidently less than eight days, then you don't know what you're doing. So you should go back to the drawing board and figure it out in more detail. Because it is impossible to estimate things that are longer than that. So once you've broken it up into tasks that take between two and eight days, then you need a team to distribute those tasks to. If it's you working by yourself, you're out of luck. You're still going to be late. But if you have a team, uh, you can distribute the tasks to different people, and very importantly, you don't just inflate the tasks. You don't just make them all one and a half x or two x's long, because that also doesn't work. Um, uh, what I do when I inflate one of my tasks is I wait until two days before the deadline, and then I start working. There's a lot of free time in that schedule for me, the worker, and I think I work pretty hard. So good luck. So the way you do it is you just leave blank space between the tasks. So you have a two-day task and a three-day task, and you leave a day and a half of blankness, and then another three-day task, you leave a day of blankness, and so on. And you spread out the tasks like that. When something goes wrong, you can take someone who's a little ahead of schedule and jam one of the small tasks into their gaps and get them ahead. And if, and if someone is consistently on schedule week after week, they get bigger and bigger gaps, and they can take on some of the bigger things. And this also has a fantastic feedback loop function for your team to it, which is that if you insist that people fix their bugs before they can take on their new tasks, the people who write the worst and buggiest code will spend most of their time fixing bugs. And this is also what you want, because your superstars are going to get really angry with you if all they do is fix other people's bugs. So this is how you do software schedules. So uh, that's my recommendation, if you actually work somewhere where you need to get things done on time. Um, so advanced past Maple, and we're now into the VC boom of the late 90s. I don't know how many people lived through it, but it was awesome. There was so much money for computing. You could get money with any idea, anytime you wanted. Just go to a cafe, find a VC, draw it on a napkin, and they would give you money. It was amazing. And so Ventures West came up with this awesome scheme where they were going to get ahead of that curve. They weren't going to wait for you to show up in a cafe. They were going to come to you while you were working on your PhD thesis and say, hey, you should start a company. And they found my friend Rob who is here at the graphics lab doing an awesome thesis on an operating system design that could run multiple uh, antagonistic programs in hard real time. So hard real time, as I think we all know, is usually done by getting rid of annoying things like malloc that might be non-deterministic and you know, replacing everything with like pre-static allocation, writing it all yourself and perfectly fitting all the gears together in the box that you knew exactly how long anything was going to take. And so Rob's system was, no, let's just do some statistics. Thank you, statistics lecturer. Um, in order to make it that we can uh, guarantee with high probability that all the tasks are going to execute in hard real time. And the guarantee we'll offer is you're going to get your time slot every 13 milliseconds, uh, rain or shine, and you'll miss at most one time slot every certain amount of time. And then if you can do your work with that amount of compute time, you're going to execute perfectly. And so this was pretty awesome. Uh, we built this system and it worked, uh, and that was pretty fun. Uh, and this was still before Java was broken. We were using uh, Java for this, and you could compile Java down to Spark assembly code, which is the bit that I did, so I have a soft spot for it, and load that Spark assembly code into the real-time section of the Solaris kernel, and it could play music perfectly, and we had like software graphic equalizer that could adjust the music as you go, and it, was, uh, and it was awesome fun. And we had a pretty fun meeting with Eric Schmidt, the CEO of, uh, of Sun, where he asked us if we wanted Sun to buy us. And we were thinking, yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. And our VC said no. We were not pleased. It was not a good day. That was not a good day. 
The VC's goal was to get enough money into the company to control the company before it had an exit, not to enable Rob to sell his company and make money. And in general, that is what the VC's goal is. So if you're working with VCs to get your idea funded, remember to be really, really thankful for the money because it is going to cost you your control. Um, you could work with angels instead as a workaround for that, or you could work with VCs and just live with the fact that you won't have control. I mean, the VCs are, in fact, giving you the money. It's very expensive to run a business. Uh, if you don't have the money, you should be thankful they give it to you. But you should expect to lose something for it. And usually the way they would get up is, you know, the first round of funding and even potentially the second round of funding don't actually quite take away your control. But they give you an amount that sounds like a really big amount to you as sort of somebody who's interested in computer science as opposed to business. And in fact, they know perfectly well there's a damn small amount that will not last you any time at all. And so that is basically how VC money works. Um, and so it's, uh, it's still fun, uh, but it's, you know, stressful too. Uh, so not having learned enough from the first startup, I went directly from that startup to my next startup, uh, which was a database company uh, called Aruna or Joint Technologies. Um, and this was the one that was already referenced that was founded based on text search data structures. And it was brilliant, brilliant technology. Actually, I was really happy to hear that the award is based on brilliant technology, not necessarily successful technology. I got lots of the brilliant kind. Um, and this is one of those. And the idea was you just treat the whole database as a giant string. And you put markup in it, show you where the column boundaries are and where the table boundaries are. But it's really just a giant text document, the whole database. And you build a suffix array on that. And suffix arrays are really, really good at certain operations, like finding individual strings in the midst of the soup. Um, and instead of thinking of the database as a database, you think of it as a text document. And you translate your SQL query into a series of text search operations that will give you the same output that a relational database would do. Um, and this turned out to be fantastically effective for a large class of uh, difficult queries. We worked with one uh, insurance company in the UK where they had a big Oracle system and the analysts were supposed to be answering business critical questions against the Oracle system. And the rules of the systems guys were simple. If you can't write your query to run in 90 minutes on our highly tuned Oracle database, you're not a good enough analyst, so come and try again tomorrow. And so you literally had a platoon of analysts coming in, they'd, they'd edit their SQL query from yesterday, they'd run it, it would take 90 minutes and get killed. They would tweak it, they would run it. It would take 90 minutes and get killed. They would tweak it, they would run it. It would take 90 minutes and get killed. And then they would go home and try again tomorrow. These are pretty good analysts who know a thing or two about statistics and math and query writing. And you might imagine that this work was super fulfilling, but actually it really wasn't. <laughs> Uh, so in our system, what you could do is you could take this stuff and you could load it into our system overnight and then they could run their queries on day-old data, which was really no problem because it was already taking them weeks to get each query running anyway. Um, and uh, it would run on the day-old data and it would execute in about two to four minutes, sometimes 10 or 11 minutes, sometimes 30 seconds, but definitely less than 90 minutes. And also on a PC that the systems guys didn't care about because it wasn't part of their system. So there were no rules about how long the queries could run, even though none of them took too long anyway. And that was great. Um, and so this was lots of fun. Uh, it was uh, really great. One of the, I thought I could share one specific trick out of here that I, that I remember and thinking was really brilliant. And it was because you could tell if a word was in the database at all, you could go right to the query. And if the query had column equals word or column contains word, you could answer in a, in a tiny fraction of a second whether that was false or not right away. And that could destroy a huge part of your where clause, which was awesome because you just insert the false there and simplify and, and a big chunk of your where clause goes away. Um, this is not quite as easy as it sounds because the where clauses aren't Boolean logic. They're actually three-valued logic. How many people have done three-valued logic? Uh, okay, almost nobody. Uh, okay, so three-valued logic, you've got true, false, and unknown. And unknown is a bit of a wrinkle in life because it doesn't combine with anything else in the way you want it to. Um, but the rules of the where clause are actually that essentially there's an implicit is true at the end of the where clause. And is true is a predicate that turns false and unknown both into false for you. And the brilliant observation Gaston had, which we patented, was that you could push that down through the tree of the expression down to the leaves. <coughs> and once you'd gotten the is true down to the leaves, uh, it was now a Boolean expression. You could apply all the usual armory of Boolean logic to it. And you could do great optimizations with it. And this had two fantastic advantages. First of all, it was hella fast. And secondly, it was correct. Its correctness turned into a bit of a sales problem because it turned out people wanted us to be incorrect in the exact same way Oracle was incorrect, um, which wasn't what we wanted because we were scientists. And this wasn't about getting the same answer. It was about getting the right answer. But um, anyway, 
Uh, so that, that was pretty exciting. And, and as a result of that kind of optimization, we had lots of cases where the fastest loop of all was a loop you never executed. And you could get huge performance wins. And that's how you get from 90 minutes down to two minutes. Um, another fun experience I had while I was at Aruna was we were flying somewhere. And this is a, a while ago. So there wasn't internet everywhere the way there is now. And we were stuck in an airport with a flight delay. And we needed to write a heap. And I said, no problem. We need to write a heap. We've got a laptop here. Let's write a heap. Who remembers the heap invariant? Three of us, three really skilled software people who write software for a living every day of their lives. Nobody could remember the heap invariant. It's like, well, come on, somebody, no internet. Eventually, we redrive the heap invariant. OK, who remembers how to write heapify? Well, if we didn't remember the invariant, you can sure bet we didn't remember how to write heapify. It took the three of us an hour and a half to write a heap. I said, guys, this is bad. It shouldn't take an hour and a half to write in a heap. We should all do it blindfolded. We need to have an algorithms club. We'll get together every Saturday at my place. We'll pick the next algorithm out of the big white book, and we'll implement it. And that'll be fun, right? And we're like, yeah, that sounds like lots of fun. I told my wife, she's like, you know the other husbands are like drinking beer and watching football. <laughs> I'm saying, you want to have an algorithms club? This is going to be like a party. It's like, yeah, we can have chips. <laughs> it was great. It was, it, we had some of the best times. Um, and, the, and the one highlight that I remember that I wanted to, to go to from this one was uh, quicksort. So um, most of us bought the algorithms book, but of course one of us was too cheap to bother with that. So they were doing all the research from first principles. So we were implementing quicksort. We all implemented it from the book, and he implemented it from Hor's original research. And his was faster than ours. OK, it's the same algorithm, folks. It can't be that his is faster than ours. And it turns out for you know, good, probably well-reasoned pedagogical reasons, the way Quicksort explained in the, all the textbooks that I could find uh, has a very small change to the order of operations for the comparisons, uh, such that the n squared case of Quicksort is about 4x more likely to occur than it is in Hoare's original paper. It's like, oh, we didn't know that. Sometimes using the real source is the way to go. Um, you know, because Hoare, if you go back to his work, he was concerned not just about things like that, but about things like, um, you know, maybe you could put sentinels in your array so you didn't have to do bounds checking. <laughs> uh, he was really trying to make it run fast because the machines were awful. Um, anyway, so that was pretty instructive. And we also discovered that you can hack around quicksort on the outside of the algorithm. So all the fixes to quicksort are all about how you pick the partition element, um, either randomizing it or doing other things like that, that are in the guts of the algorithm. But you can go to the outside of the recursion and you can hack it there too. And you can get rid of n squared on the outside too. So that was, uh, those were pretty fun results out of Algorithms Club. And I was going to write a paper on this at some point, but I never got to it. But anyway, uh, the take home message here is I think it's worth really knowing your tools. And I think we had a lot of fun with this. Maybe you want to drink beer and watch football, but I suggest this is a better alternative. Um, so arriving at Google. So I went to Google in 2006 to get out of management. So I need to tell you a bit about my algorithm for finding jobs so that this can be well understood. Well, I'm not doing well for time. I will go as fast as I can. Um, my algorithm for finding jobs is get a bunch of job offers, go home on the weekend, look at all the job offers, pick the best one. And uh, within the constraint that all companies must be less than 120 people, because Maple is too big and bureaucratic. Uh, so you need small companies. Uh, so how did I wind up at Google? Well, it was like, well, I'm interviewing for all these jobs anyway. And Google is like a big name. I should interview there just for fun, just for a lark. They'll fly me to California. It's got to be good. And they flew me to California, and they, I did seven interviews in a row. And all the interviews at Google are the same. It's like, here's a technical puzzle. Write the code for it. Here's a technical puzzle. Come up with the algorithm for it. It was so much fun. Everybody knew exactly what they were talking about. It was just each interviewer knew their problem. They knew the solutions. They knew everything. It was great. One of them even asked me something where I thought, oh, shit, I don't know the answer. <laughs> and that was best of all. Um, I, I did get that one, but it was harder. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. And I got out of those interviews, and I called my wife, and I said, I don't care how big and bureaucratic it is. If they can serve me up seven seemingly randomly chosen interviewers who are that smart, I just have to work here. I have to break my small company rule. And then I waited for a few weeks, and uh, no offer came through. I thought, oh, I guess I screwed it up. I mean, I thought I did great, but apparently I'm wrong. I usually think I do great at everything. So it's hard. Like, when you have that kind of misjudgment <laughs> around you, it's hard to know. Uh, so I was, you know, was going to go home with my other four offers and pick between them, each of which was at a small company, each of which I knew who I would have to fire if I went there. Um, and, 
I was going to think about that. I got this call like 3 o'clock Friday afternoon. It was Google. I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm making my choice this weekend. You know, thanks for considering me. Um, you know, I can see you're not interested since I don't have an offer. She's like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> I'm still preparing an offer for you. Please wait. It's like, oh, okay, I can wait another week. <laughs> and here I am. And the idea was, one of the benefits of going to Google was they had bought this startup, and this startup was going to have managers and admins and all that kind of infrastructure stuff that I had at my startups, and so it was going to be great. And I got to the startup, and there were three of us. Um, I mean, I was number four. There were three others. And the three others weren't managers or admins or things like that <laughs> that we needed. And I just ignored that for a year. In our first year in 2006, we grew from four to six people. And in the back of my mind, my manager bit kept saying, if you were in Mount View, you would shut this office down. If you were in Mount View, you'd shut this office down. So in 2007, I thought, I don't need to fix this by becoming a manager. I can just take over recruiting. I made a critical misstep here. Like I said, I'm usually pretty blind to my errors, but I caught this one a little too late. I hired 24 people and then realized I failed to hire a manager on the way. <laughs> so that leads to this next piece of advice, which is if you don't want to be one, hire your manager. Um, I was also working on uh, Wireless Transcoder at the time, and Wireless Transcoder was pretty interesting because it had a few tens of millions of users. And the great thing about tens of millions of users is that they can hit your service multiple times per second. And when they're hitting your service multiple times per second, the things that you thought, oh, this is not too likely, I don't have to code for this case, they happen every second. <laughs> That's pretty frustrating. And the, those asserts that I love to write, they happen every day. And so that was... Uh, Pretty, pretty eye-opening for me, operating at that kind of scale. Um, you can deal with metrics and statistics in a whole new way when you can put your product out to 10 million people that morning. And so scale is pretty awesome. Another thing I learned while working on Transcoder uh, was this great lesson about user studies. We did a user study. We're watching the user do stuff, and the user's making all these mistakes. And the UI designer is with me behind the soundproof wall saying, oh my god, I made a mistake. And I'm thinking, no, the user's an idiot. And the user would make another mistake. And the UI designer would go, oh my god, I made a mistake. And eventually I came to understand that the UI designer was right. Like the users were all obviously going to make mistakes. And if they were making mistakes, that meant the design was wrong. But it took quite a while for me to rewire that in my brain, that, you know, that the user is going to do it wrong because they are. Because I, like most people, don't understand why you wouldn't learn a few simple concepts, like how the shell tools work, that combine together in a combinatorial explosion of ways to give you all kinds of power. And most users don't understand why you'd want to learn a concept, let alone multiple concepts. Multiple concepts, that's madness. Why even learn one? And so it's really hard. And you know, I've watched user studies do things like describe a feature that they want that is on the screen in front of them. They even gave it the same name as the button on the screen. <laughs> and they wouldn't click it. <laughs> so it can be hard. Um, anyway, uh, within a short time of Google, it was pretty apparent people are good. And people's competence uh, engenders deep trust. When you know the people around you are good, uh, you know, trust avoids misunderstanding. It allows you to take shortcuts. It allows you to be brisk when you shouldn't be. It allows you to get things done faster. And so I advise you in all size organizations to focus on competence and character and trust. It will really make your life much better. I have worked in 20 person organizations that I kid you not have more politics than Google has now at tens of thousands. It's ridiculous. And all those politics are rooted in one simple thing. The people don't trust each other. In the worst case scenario, people hated each other. When I stole, sold Gaston's company to, to his CEO, the legal agreement for the sale was this thick printed out. That's a lot of paper. And I had to keep a copy because I'm in it with liabilities and nonsense. Anyway, trust, important. Um, trying to really go fast here. Uh, this one is actually a pretty significant one, but I'll just say it as briefly as I can. You need to find the trends and plan around them. If people don't read books anymore, don't make books. If people uh, you know, want to use short form 140 character messages because of some stupid service that's made that common, think about how to squeeze things into 140 characters. Work with the trends that are out there because the world is changing around us. And figuring out how the world is changing and riding that wave is the biggest way to make a big plan. Um, this one I can basically skip. I love CNC, 3D printing, and cloud. These things are awesome. You can do so much prototyping now that you can never do before. This here is a picture frame I made a few weeks ago on the weekend where I just ordered some parts from China, assembled them together, and every morning it updates and shows you my weight chart, or shows me my weight chart right now, you my weight chart. As you can see, it's not that successful, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm measuring it, and I have a belief that what you measure, you can adjust. Um, 
And then sort of related to trust is, you know, tell people the hard stuff when it's true. Admit that you don't know things, own your mistakes, own the mistakes of your team especially. Um, these things add up to a sense of integrity. And I think that when people sense that you are true to yourself and true to the principles you believe in, they are more willing to take chances with you and go with you places where they're not sure. And on the back of integrity, uh, you can do a lot of great stuff that's otherwise very difficult. And uh, integrity should not be for sale, and once sold, cannot be bought back. Do I have time for questions? Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for Alex? Pass. Alex, um, how difficult is the transition from managing a group of five men to managing multiple groups of five people each or ten people each or all the way up to the ladder? The question is, how difficult it is going from managing groups of five people to managing two groups of five, or maybe three groups of five, or ultimately, I actually currently have 180 something. Um, so it does get grow without bound, it seems. Um, I think there's a few different uh, steps to the transition. Uh, how difficult it is, I think, depends a lot on how much the person wants to be a manager. Normally, when I'm suggesting people that, that they think about management at Google, I ask them a key question that I think helps differentiate somebody who should not be a manager from somebody who should be. So I think this question is helpful before you even think about how hard it is. And the question that differentiates is, do you want to control what gets done, or do you want to control how it gets done? If you want to control what gets done, then you could be a manager, because that's really all you get to pick, is where you're going to put your pawns who are going to do all the actual work. If you want to control how it gets done, you can't really be a manager of any group bigger than five, because you can't control the technical details of the algorithm and the actual work um, without actually still being in the weeds, right? So an individual contributor can maybe scale up to as high as a team of eight or 12 or something, but higher than that's not possible. And so assuming the person wants to control what gets done, then you have to ask them, do you care about people? Like, do you want to control what gets done just because you're an empire builder and you think it'd be great to run this giant empire? Or do you actually care about each and every individual in your organization? You want to know when they're having children, what their life story is, what their life ambition is, why they happen to be working on this particular subroutine today even though they'd rather be doing something else. You got to know those things. And if you know those things and you care personally about the people, you can help them navigate their own careers and be effective. And that's really important. So if you've got that combination, the person wants to control what gets done and um, uh, not how it gets done, and the person wants to pay attention to people and make them successful in their lives, then you've got a potential manager. Now you can talk about how hard it is to manage 15 people. And the biggest problem with managing 15 people is that you've got to do stuff that doesn't matter and not do the stuff that matters. So I mean, I like writing code, right? I like producing things that actually do stuff. And you've got to let go of that. And you've got to focus on instead valuing the time you're spending building up your team. And then the more you're able to work in abstractions, the better it is. And I think that lesson um, is one that has to be learned a few times over. Um, so for me, that was the hardest part. The hardest part was letting go of the feeling that I no longer do any work, but I just talk to people all the time like this. Right? And, and it, was, it was a long transition for me to from, hey, I'm not doing anything myself, therefore I'm not doing any work, to feeling like, no, actually, all the work these other people are doing, because they feel like I've given them some glimmer of a direction or some glimmer of an idea, and they've taken that to a next level that I couldn't have taken it to, and feeling pride in that second order effect uh, has really been what's enabled me to scale. And now with my team of 180, where we work on web platform and graphics for Chrome at Google, it's like, we can actually do things that cause Apple to change their minds about what they're doing. That's crazy. I mean, Apple is really obstreperous. <laughs> I choose a word that you might need to look up. Um, but you know, it's, it's amazing that we can have that influence. And so I'm now getting pleasure from that. But the hardest thing was transitioning from taking pleasure in direct creation from pleasure from that. Um, and my workaround for my failure to do it is I have a side project that I code on about three to six hours a week. Um, and that gets, lets me have a little bit of time to actually still write some code of my own. Other questions? I usually ask this from people who are in management position. Uh, what's your intake of open source? Because I recently had a meeting with one of the people you mentioned, and this was in-house only. I want to see what's your take on that. So the question is, what's my take on open source? So this is a bit of a softball question since I run a piece of Chrome. Yes. And Chrome is probably one of the biggest open source projects on the yes. planet. Um, m my take on open source is, uh, 
is, is that I think it's a really great way to show in, in concrete terms that you don't have control and that your power doesn't come from control, right? So Google, producing an open source browser for the web, has seen our browser forked hundreds of times. And many dozens of those are very popular alternate splinters of Chrome that have a lot of users. And this is a good thing because it keeps the development process honest. It keeps us focused on what the users really need and what the developers really need. And, and that has huge high value. And we pay a high price for that. It is not cheap. Turns out we have this pretty cool ads machine that turns out uncounted buckets of money still working so far. Um, and so we can get away with it. But it's expensive, right? So the short answer to your question about open source is that um, where you can leverage open source to give your business a leg up, sure, that's a, a reasonable use. Where you can afford to do open source as part of your business model, I think it's valuable to the world. It is more expensive. You will pay a price. You should get something for that price. In Google's case, what we get is the openness of the web and the idea that no single stakeholder controls the web. And I think that's crucially important to our users. And I still believe in don't be evil. And so here we are. One last question. My answers are too long. Uh, I, I don't actually know what this means in Japan, but the best I can guess is people thought that I was doing something weird and they wanted no part of it. <laughs> um, uh, I think it just had no meaning to the people and it was embarrassing that I was doing this strange thing. Um, it would be like if I had gotten up and started singing or something. They would have just thought I was drunk. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you, I mean, Universal just isn't, I guess. Just isn't. I, I, I presume they die. The question was, how do they sign? <laughs> the question was, how do they sign their choking? In, in Japan, the notion that you would inconvenience somebody else is very deeply wrong, right? When you see people wearing the face masks in Japan, it's not because they're afraid of your germs. It's because they're sick, and they don't want to inconvenience you by spreading their germs. And they will wear the face mask for many days after being sick to avoid inconveniencing others. Because their whole psyche is not around the progress of the individual, but around the progress of the group. It's about the progress of society. And all your actions are measured by whether they're good for society. And it's just for a North American mindset, or at least my mindset, completely counter to everything I believe in. I'm, I'm like out here to win my games. I, like that you, you're, you're my opponent who is worthy to play against me. But to care about my actions helping you is not my first order thinking. In Japan it is. Um, and so I don't know, maybe if you're choking you should die because somebody saving you would take time out of their day. <laughs> Thank you, guys.